thank you everyone for joining this morning. It's great to have you here. And Alex, thank you very much for taking the time to join us. Um, Alex was uh, it presented in the webinar series that we hosted uh, in the summer last year. Uh, it was absolutely fascinating about what Nature Capital are up to, the vision, the values, how farmers and land managers can transition towards more regenerative practices using natural capital, capital principles. So yeah, really excited to talk to Alex a little bit more today about what's been going on and uh, you know what the vision for the future is. So I think we'll get going. Um, so Alex, yeah, great to have you with us this morning. Thank you for being here. And um, yeah, to really get going, the way that we set these up is that first part is really about understanding a bit more about your journey, how you got to where you are today, um, kind of what inspires you, you know, what you're actually working on at the moment, as well as a little bit of a vision for the future. So yeah, Alex, over to you. We'd love to hear a little bit about your journey. Sure. Uh, well, Tim, great, great to be here. Thanks very much for, for having me on. Um, loving the series, loving the, loving the interviews to date. And, and uh, yeah, it's very exciting driving everybody forward. Um, uh, okay, there's a little bit of, a little bit of background for, for myself then. I, grew, I mean, I live in, in Gloucestershire. I grew up on a farm um, in, you know, top of the cop, top of the Cotswolds, and so sort of the outdoors has always been, and the sort of farming environment has always been a, a huge part of my life from growing up as, as a child. And um, everything to, to do to do with that, I was probably most at home running around in the woods um, rather than being sat behind a desk. But uh, needs must, and we all seem to find our way to, to to here eventually. And I mean, I think that that was sort of sort of childhood growing up, and um, and then I sort of went off to went off to the army, uh, ran around in a, in a few more woods, and um, went to a few hot 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 dusty places. And um, but you know, it makes the heart you know when you're when you're away from everything, the heart sort of grows fonder. And um, I'm you know very fortunate to. To, to grow up on a farm and and wanting to come wanting to come back here wanting to start to really get stuck in stuck into what what we're doing at, at Moorwood and and start to sort of make some changes and, and start to adapt and so I left left the army and went and joined Savills and became a chartered surveyor really built up um, that sort of professional knowledge um, seeing seeing how guys who were doing it day in and day out were doing it building up I think also that wider wider sort of estate management type knowledge of looking at you know pro property uh, as well as, as sort of straight agricultural practices and, and everything else that, that rural businesses are, are involved in and then I really sort of noticed as, as part of this that um, natural capital was being completely written in and interwoven into into policy everywhere the 25-year environment plan at that stage the um, draft environment bill the draft uh, agricultural bill and I was just looking at this going this you know we're, we're approaching a, a complete game change moment and this coincided with Brexit and everything else that was going on on there and and I was just looking at this again there's, there's just a, it, we're at a pivotal moment probably the biggest change since 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 after the second world war and that was sort of where I was started to focus on on natural natural capital and you know what what it meant and you know what it meant to me on the farm but also what it meant from a business perspective and and so so yes, yeah, so I left left Savills and um, joined Mapani Capital and really focused on in on, on the international market. So particularly on sort of conservation assets throughout Africa. Um, and so we were doing look coming at this from a valuation perspective. So trying to value um, financially value uh, these these massive assets. So we were looking at a million and a half acre tropical rainforest in Gabon and four hundred thousand acres in of game reserve in, in Mozambique and. Uh, it was just absolutely incredible sort of wilderness wilderness assets and sort of putting putting a price on those and then transacting on on that as well so that really sort of helped help i think should shape where where i was coming from from a sort of land management a sort of farming land management practical approach but equally that the sort of financial aspects to, to natural capital as well and then about a year and a half ago um so we set up nature nature capital and my, my focus was was purely on on the uk market and that was that was because it was it's very close to home. I really wanted to to start to make a difference, you know, with a young family. I didn't want to be disappearing off around the world quite so much either. But I really wanted to focus on on what we were doing in within the UK, um, and so that's been been my sort of my sole sole focus. And I think I sort of live and breathe natural capital, um, especially during during lockdown. It's 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 pretty much constant. Um, so yes, yeah, so I think that's probably probably my background and, and where I'm coming at it from. Um, and that sort of sh sort of shapes, you know, where, where I guess nature capital has, has come out of. 
But I would say that Nature Capital, it, you know, we're a team. There's, you know, there's there's no um, there's not an individual. I don't think any sort of one person can can make. I don't know big believe they make a massive difference by themselves I think actually it's always a team that really drives everything forward and so as it, that was a huge part of our process behind sort of building nature capital and developing our, our methodology behind it was you know we're a team so I you know that's my background we, you know Jack Heathcote Amory who's got a, a corporate finance background you know he was with JP, JP Morgan uh, and and also latterly with, with, with Savills and so he comes at it from from that sort of angle and then Tom Tom Hardy, he's um, you know he's a, a an environmental consultant, and a, a, and an ecologist by training. So you start to, to speak that language. And then James Cairns, who's um, you know who, who I was involved with on all, all the international uh, valuations. Again, that sort of land management valuation perspective, but very much in the international market. And so you know you start to bring these you know the, the sort of these core uh, core skill sets together, all pulling in the right direction. And start to bang your heads together to try and solve solve some of these problems that you by yourself don't have the I don't think have the ability to, to solve as, as well. And so I think this is what it's all about. So whether we're you know farms and estates, it's we're always bringing our teams together. We've all got individual skill sets, and if we can all be sort of pulling in the right direction, that we can solve our, our own problems, whether that's you know on on the farm or or you know all the way up to to, to government and, and and policy level, everything in between. It's our own skill sets combined with with other with other people's pulling in, in the right direction and so that's what, what we've sought to do and that's really the I think one of the things that we then try to bring to 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 landholders that, that we're helping and, and we're sort of advising around the country. Alex that's great I, I think what would be I mean it's I think it really points to something important is that and as we're seeing kind of lockdown has really helped this kind of collaborative endeavor to all, all be pushing in the same direction which I don't think maybe would have been possible if we didn't have, if we weren't working from home and had Zoom to kind of keep us keep us all together. Um, in terms of kind of the work that you were doing in Africa, I think that might be quite interesting just to touch on because clearly some very um, successful case studies, you know, big areas, uh, huge amounts of valuation work that would have gone into those and actual transactions that resulted off the back of them. Is there anything you can sort of share from that, you know, the, what you learned in Africa that maybe could be applied here or is there such a different context that doesn't relate is there, yeah, what are the comparables? I mean, I think that this is, you know, we, we were applying, um, you know, standard red, RICS red book methodology. So that was our, our starting point, you know, exactly the same as, you know, as if you get an, an agent to, to, to value a farm or a landed asset here. So it's exactly the same process. But we were, we were doing is recognizing a natural capital premium because, you know, you're talking, when you're talking about a million and a half um, acres of, of tropical rainforest, you know there aren't comparables that you can you know comparables you can just go go across to uh, you know there's, there's very few sort of case studies so you have to start to use um some of the maybe the the darker arts within within valuations to start to try and rec recognize that um and and so that's what we're trying to do and at the end of the day this is all about really informing an investment decision um but it's got to be credible and so that's you know if you really break it break it down that's what that was one part that that our approach came back to but um so, so I think you know we, we definitely brought brought that across, but it was embedding that natural capital framework and looking at that the, at um, looking at natural capital as the lens or the optics through which um, you know we all look at, at, at land because you start to recognise all the other benefits. So I mean, just it's probably worth a very quick background. So natural natural capital are the assets. So that's the, the soil, the the um, the air, the water. The minerals; those are the are sort of core assets that all land holdings have in, in one form or another. But from them, we derive a series of benefits in the form of ecosystem services. So in the UK, we're always focused on, um, we're generally focused on agriculture and food production, um, timber management potentially, uh, and and some some renewables. So, so the provisioning services that we that we can get. But actually, if we don't look at all the other ecosystem um, so, uh, benefits being provided such as carbon sequestration, flood alleviation, species habitat, water filtration, whatever it happens to be, is you know, a, a, a plethora of those. If we don't look at those in our management decision making, then, then we're starting to, 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 we're either ignoring them because financially then they're, they're not as relevant and that, that's changing and that's a, a really good thing. Um, and things like the Dasgupta review that we've just had out this week, are, you know, really, really influencing that. And so we would, you know, in, in, in Africa and those international valuations, we're trying to bring those to the fore and recognize that this land holding, you know, a million and a half acres of tropical rainforest is actually having 
a, a series of benefits. And so when you can then start to monetize carbon sequestration and carbon offsetting, that then start that basically puts a financial value on, on that ecosystem service. And so then suddenly a your the, the way to make money from that landholding is not just about um, food production. It's not just about chopping down the trees to, 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 to deliver the timber for use elsewhere because that landholding is providing other value and that we can monetize it. So, so it's, a, it's, a, it's a balance. It's one, it's looking at, at, at that landholding with, with the natural capital lens um, because you see all the other benefits and you may well prioritize uh, food production still, but you're aware of everything else. And that is basically going to make your decisions and, and your management processes much more sustainable, almost certainly, because you're aware of some of the damage or some of the impact that, that, that can be done. Um, so I think that's really where we came at it from. And I, but I think also, uh, you know, I look at um, Karen Ghani in Mozambique and the valuation uh, valuations for there. You know, it was informing, it was informing transactions. And, um, you know, that, that's, a, that's, a that's sort of fundamental proof. Um, you know, whether, it, whether you do a red book, um, uh, red book valuation or whether you're just articulating. And I would say in the UK with our natural capital grade, we're, we're articulating the performance of a landholding's natural capital um, assets and the, their ecosystem services. So we're not trying to put a value, we're not trying to say it's worth X or it's, it's worth Y. We're just trying to recognize for, for somebody, whether that's the, 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 the landholder, the landowner, the, the manager, an investor, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. That we're trying to enable them to make an informed, an informed decision. And so that's the lens to look at any kind of land, land management or, or, or land use through, uh, because you're considering everything that's, that's, that's going on. So I think that Excellent. was a huge part that came out of it for us. That, that is really interesting, because I think, although obviously we're going to talk about the UK context, but looking internationally really helps, especially at a broad scale, because, you know, well, partly what I'm wondering is those were two very specific examples that you know you mentioned that Mapani were a part of. Um, what's to well, I guess a couple of questions. One is what was the process to analyze those natural assets and therefore judge their performance, but also what's to stop that approach being brought into more conservation reserves or na national parks throughout Africa? Like, is that a possibility that you see playing out? So we actually add additional value to these wilderness areas to cause more protection. Yeah, a hundred, hundred percent. It's it's exactly it's those it's those it's those principles can can could be used anywhere. I mean, they can be used used within the UK. I think it's there's just more more sort of comparable data here. So so the valuation is you know is potentially harder to to look at from that perspective. But I I think you know this is this is where everybody's driving. We have to have we have to start to put a, a financial value on these other ecosystem services. And that doesn't mean saying that you know a, a bird or a bee is worth five pounds or, or twenty pounds. Where we, where I sit is much more around relating it back to that landholding. Is if that landholding is is supporting you know really significant at risk species, for example, well something is something is you know is is um, that's you know something being done. There's something something's going on that's right there. Um, that that's really important. That elsewhere you know that's not being not being recognised. So, so what is being done there that actually is, 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 is supporting that? So I think this is where you know, almost the confusion comes in is, is very, it doesn't sort of mean enough with, when we go into, we take natural capital accounting to, to, to too much of an extreme because, because just, you know, if you say a B is worth five pounds, it just doesn't, it just doesn't actually translate. Whereas actually, if you, if you can start to look at that land holding, it's the land that's supporting that. And, and then the, the, the land uses that are, in, are impacting that. And then you can start to start to build build value on 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 from from there. I think that's probably a more important way of doing it. But you, you look at things like the the Maasai Mara and the Serengeti and the Mara conservancies around the Maasai Mara. They're just as important to to to, to wildlife as the the, Mara, the Maasai Mara game reserve is is in itself. And they're an extension of that. So if those are lost to agricultural production because that becomes the primary driver and it's how the money how people can make money over, over the, in that in that particular instance then the, the Maasai Mara itself um you know shrinks as a result because the buffer zone around it starts to shrink so these things are you know they're very timely really really significant and um you know lots of people go, go and visit the Maasai Mara but it would be poorer um if if those conservancies around it are are, are not maintained and not not kept there potentially even even expanded if there's more demand for people to people to go and see it and there's more demand for 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 wildlife and the other benefits 
that are being delivered by by places like that. And it, it so Alex, I mean, everything you're saying, I think, so what there's, there's kind of, I guess, maybe a couple of ways to look at this, one of which is, yeah, if we continue in the old model, where it is about kind of exploiting the natural resources, kind of undermining their future potential just to extract financial benefits now, like cutting down forests or degrading soilscapes, whatever it might be. And the alternative is obviously to invest back into nature so that we do have this resilience forward into the future. But of course, for that investment to go into land, you need to have these investment models where people know that they can invest and derive some form of return, especially if it's going to be big money, say pension fund money or whatever. Yeah. So I guess maybe the question I've got on the international front is um, why maybe is it not more prevalent or, or is it and we just don't know about it? Um, and what are the blockers for it becoming the new status quo in you know, land management in conservation and um, I guess that's maybe on a macro side in the international space, but also looking at more at a farmscape, you know, can those markets naturally translate into smaller holdings or, you know, kind of cluster farming groups in an international spectrum as well. So what's needed that's missing that would enable that market to really thrive, I guess? I think, I mean, actually, it's, it's amazingly simple. It's stability. And uh, it's the stability of those those nations, and um, that is a huge a huge impact. And it's, it then comes just down to risk. What do, what are you are you prepared to risk? Uh, you know, you know, cold hard cash, if you like, because you don't know that 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 country will remain stable. Because it's not like the UK, which has been, if you like, gen for the most part, very stable for for a long time. So there's a huge amount of trust built up. And this is why I think it. You know, what's really critical is that. Um, you know, investment in, in foreign countries, if, if the Canadian Sovereign Wealth Fund brought into the Maasai Mara Conservancy, it would stabilise, massively stabilise, um, you know, that, that as one as an asset, but also the country, because it would, it would, it would help prevent a loss, because rather than, you know, uh, you know a, a couple of individuals, you're then starting to have different countries invested in each other. I mean, that can go a whole nother, another way with, with resources and, and be seen in a completely different light. I completely accept that. Um, but I think you know there are benefits that can be had there, and it holds everyone more to, more to account internationally. But I think this is where what's actually really important is it's proving um, the value concept. I think in places like the UK first, and then helping to, to to move that out. So the UK almost becomes, if you like, a case study for for the rest of the world, and they can see you know, good potentially and potentially bad ways. But they can learn learn from what we're doing. But other countries as well. The UK is not the the only one doing this. Australia, I would have said, are, are way ahead on, on, on some aspects. Certainly things like soil, soil carbon that Microsoft have just bought 40,000 soil carbon credits off, off a farmer in, in Australia. You know, I've cited here again, come on, come on, um, GB, we can, we can, you know, we can do this as, as well. You know, it, it, there's, there's, it's not just us doing. The, the US are actually looking, looking very hard at a lot of this, and, and there's a lot of farmers actually really driving, driving it forward. And you know, certainly teachings of Gabe Brown from a regenerative agricultural perspective are definitely getting a lot of weight um, over here as well. I think what it really comes down to, though, Tim, is, and if we put it back into that UK con context, is actually it's you know we talk about carbon sequestration and the importance of it, and uh, we talk about the importance of you know, provenance and accountability in food production. But actually what we need is we need tool sets. It's all very well talking about it, but if we don't have those tool sets that, that allow us to, to enact on it, then, then actually it's very, very difficult for, for, for us to start to make changes on, on the ground. And so that's where in the UK, I think, you know, we are starting to make some traction here. And I look at things like um, the DEFRAMetric, which is the, the sort of the core tool for, for measuring uh, biodiversity net gain. You know, this is going to be absolutely huge for, for, for every every landholder, I think, within the UK. But but it's it's really significant. You know, when we're trying to build back greener, that that, um, that what that actually means, what that translates to, is you know offsetting uh, a negative um, biodiversity impact with a, with a positive one, and making then a net difference. And you know, ten percent is what's being put around. But there's nothing to stop that being being higher than higher than ten percent. And you know, I. Be encouraging for, for more than that and this is where i think also it's it's the opportunity for for um for businesses and, and individuals to look at this and go right is everything that's coming down the line is it a threat you know is the fact that i have to offset we have to be carbon carbon neutral net zero i have to offset my company's um carbon emissions by 2050 or, or well before that is that a threat or is that an opportunity 
if it's just a threat, you're just going to do the bare minimum. But if it's an opportunity, then you get, then you can actually really jump on this and it gives you the opportunity to, to, to shout about, to, to shout about this. And so, I mean, that's why I love the example of, of Brewdog because they've gone out and gone, you know, we're, we're going to plant uh, all these trees, we plant a whole load of trees, we're going to do some peatland restoration. And actually, if you, if you buy Brewdog, drink our beer, you're going to save the planet because they're double offsetting the, the carbon that, that they have, that, that it takes for them to, 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 to brew, their, brew their beer. I mean, that's, that, it's a great example of, of, a, of, a, of a corporate, if you like, or a, a business, it probably wouldn't like being called a corporate, but a business being, um, being proactive and seeing this actually as an opportunity and a way to engage with, 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 with um, people that want to drink their beer and actually using it as a, as a positive tool. So I think there's, there's lots of different ways to look at it. And I, you know, for, for us and how we've developed, uh, so as Nature Capital, how we've developed the grade, it's, it's there um, as a tool to, to reflect the performance of a landholding's natural capital. So we look at the extent of, of what's going on on the landholding, the impact that it's having and its potential. And my view is that if you can reflect that, then that's what you can use to inform decision-making because you've got to you set a baseline and then you can start to tangibly demonstrate uh, progress um, as, as, you, as you make those changes. And for me, that's all about outcomes. Outcomes are, are critical to here because the, the processes that we all take, it doesn't, it, I mean, it really doesn't matter. It's probably a good thing that we all have a different, we take a different um, overarching process and then very different levels within that. So, you know, everyone sort of looks at re rewilding. Well, that's fine. It's, it's one process, regenerative agriculture, one process, commercial agriculture, um, or organic, uh, you, you know, you name it. They're all just different processes and you can take them all to one degree or another. But actually what, what's, what's, um, what transcends all of them are the outcomes. Every single one of them has a carbon balance. Every single one of them ha ha has um, varying impacts on biodiversity presence, um, on, on soil management and, and water management. And so, and those are the fundamentals. And that's why, again, those are your, unsurprisingly, your, those are your natural capital assets. So I think the, you know, it doesn't matter too much what processes are, are, are being undertaken. And I think that's for, for each individual or for, for, for everyone on their own to, to go, am I doing, taking the right process? How can I start to, to make my process better? But if you're not measuring those outcomes, then, then it's very difficult to understand how you compare to anybody else, let alone within you know, a regenerative agricultural or commercial agricultural um, space. So I think that's what I would, you know, one of the things I'd really encourage people to do is start to understand and, and start to, to measure, even in a basic way, some of those outcomes so that they can, they can understand the impact of, of, of what they're doing. And again, that's where it comes down to, to a tool set. You know, this is, this is, you know, this is our sort of, if you like, I mean, I think it's, I see it as a value add tool set in that what we're trying to do is, is, is um, reflect performance so that when somebody's making a decision, they can see, oh, that, that place is performing Better, better than somewhere else. So therefore I will buy my carbon credits from there and I will pay a premium from, for, for them. Uh, or my biodiversity net gain units, that's, a, that's an A grade uh, land holding. I, I really want to, to buy my carbon credits from there and I will pay more uh, for, for doing that because uh, it's delivering so many other, that wider um, impact investment. So that's when, we, you know, so, so this is when you start to integrate some of the other benefits of, or some of the other thinking. So. Uh, environmental social governance that's the old uh, corporate sustainable, sustainable responsibility that old CSR approach from a, an, in, uh, an investment perspective and and this is where everybody wants everyone investing wants a financial return and it's really it's really critical that um, that we deliver a financial return and so, so it's economically viable but equally people also want uh, a, a level of impact with, with that as well so one, how can we actually deliver that on the ground? But two, how can we articulate that? And so again, for, for ourselves, this is where we think something like the, the grade, which is in essence, it's, it's just an intuitive, dare I say it, uh, in a really simple form. You know, we've got, you've got an EPC uh, certificate for your house. So, so we think it starts to translate across from the property perspective. A friend of mine, um, when he first saw it, uh, not knowing anything about natural crafts, and that's fine, I forgive him. He said, oh, I've got one of those in my fridge. And, um, and he's right, you know, those principles, but that tells you something, something about it. And so very quickly, you can see that one image and you can find out a huge amount of, about, in, in our case, a land holding and, and, how, and how it's performing. And so when, you know, when you're then, you know, it might be buying food from them, uh, for, from that land holding, it might be purchasing your, your carbon units, your carbon credits. This then becomes really significant because those carbon units and, uh, and biodiversity net gain credits won't have 
a, a set price. That, you know, and, and I think it's actually, if I can drive it home, Tim, by way of an example, if you buy your carbon credits from a Sitka commercial forestry block, a Sitka spruce plantation, um, you know, just you know, just that as a core asset. Now, there may, as a whole, it may be doing, having some wider wider benefit, but that's unlikely to have that that carbon there is unlikely to be having as wider benefit as buying it from, let's let's say a, a native woodland um, plant plantation adjoining uh, a, a triple SI, or, or you know, and that's and that's potentially that's that's close to you. There's other environmental benefits that start that start to be layered in, or other uh, flood alleviation or water filtration benefits, and you know, if you can start to recognise that, some of those will become more important, and that can start to be reflected in, in a premium for that landholder. So, so, and as farmers, farmers, there's a huge opportunity. Yes, there's there's, there's the stick and there's the threat coming, uh, with with the loss of BPS and um, and that that's drawing down, and that that's you know a very real time threat. I also think that, um, f- from my from my perspective, I would look at something like red diesel. Red diesel's very much got a lifespan, uh, a timeline on it, especially with, under the, under an, you know, a looming agriculture uh, environment environment bill, and so things like that. You can straight away. It's very easy to look at your balance sheet and put a line through BPS. Is my bus- is my business still viable? Add forty seven pence a litre to my red my red diesel uh, um, uh, figures, so that I'm actually just aware. And you're starting to actually then inform your business decisions. Um, um, is my business still viable in its current form or do I need to, to start to, to look at this in a different way start to, to move the steam liner which basically is what businesses are away from from the, the risk and towards the, the opportunity and so I would say in, in the most simple terms that's what what we're trying to do as a in as, as nature capital is what I'm trying to do on the farm at home I'm trying to to move it away from the risk and, to, and towards the opportunity, so that I can be as viable as possible, um, and try and allow myself, uh, allow us to, to thrive and, and, and do well in this world. Alex, it's so interesting, and I've got so many questions, and I'm also <laughs> conscious of time. Um, so, one thing I want to just point out is, so Prince Charles's Terracotta that came out recently. There are a lot of CEOs of big companies that have signed up to that, and they are very likely to be the ones that are going to fund you know, positive uplift on, in the environment. And I guess it really, in, in the terracotta, what he also talks about is new measurements for uh, or measurement methodologies for appraising impact for ESG investment. And I guess what you're pointing to here is we must have the toolkit and the way of appraising the outcomes so that we can justifiably take, take the money from the corporates, right? You know, who want to offset their carbon. They want to know what they're buying. And then if they don't find out and they can't put it on a glossy magazine or, you know, have it as part of their annual report, it's not going to cut the mustard. They're not going to justify the expenditure into the environment. So I think, yeah, going back to your point on kind of the measurements methodology, I think what would be kind of useful just to kind of open up slightly your your toolkit and just say, like, in what way does, you know, I guess you could say information flow into that and flow out like how could that be a circular loop that goes back up to the corporates that justifies the pension funds putting millions of pounds into the environment is there anything you can say on that because i think people will be really curious to know what that that data flow is to really unlock this capital so on their farms. two aspects in that tim so firstly you're, you're absolutely right i mean so uh, it, this is all about tool sets ultimately we can talk about carbon as, as one thing to we're blue in the face but actually, if we don't have the tool sets to, to be able to do the offset, it, does, it just doesn't translate. And so, you know, this is what we really need. We, you know, we want um, the likes of the, the CLA and the NFU and, and our organisation like this to really be pushing, in my mind, as a farmer, for, the, for things like a, a, a soil carbon code. You know, we've got a woodland carbon code, a, a peatland carbon code. Yes, they're not perfect by any stretch of imagination, but, we, but they're an accredited system. A soil carbon code is about the closest thing to myself as an agricultural farmer or any, as an arable farmer who, you know, that we've got to a silver bullet to replace BPS, for example, and to start, start to, um, to diversify and help, help us diversify those income streams and stack our revenues. So I think that those tool sets, that, that point is so important and, it, and it's, it's absolutely critical for all of us. But that also then translates across to the, to the corporates who are going, I, 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 we want a degree of, of accountability. This has to stack up. Now, um, we're approaching this uh, for, for what we're doing through the lens of a sort of corporate sustainability partnership where you've got two entities. But in essence, you know, we can only do so, so many of these where you bring together a, a land holding and, and a corporate and they basically do, do a, 
a sustainability partnership um, for a series of rights based on, on carbon. So it's, it's the principles of carbon plus other benefits. Um, and that for the corporate might be market access as well. It might be um, the opportunity to, to, to go and use uh, event facilities on, 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 on that estate, for example. So there's lots of different ways, ways of doing it, but the corporate has to get something out. It has to be, has to be a, a benefit to, to, the, to the businesses as well. Um, and you know, from a corporate's perspective, they, they, you know, they're seeing this as, yes, potentially a threat, but also as an opportunity. And if they can articulate that impact and deliver it on the, on the ground, that, that wider environmental impact, they know that they can meet that ESG criteria um, and deliver impact for their, for their investors that want that. Well, that gives them competitive advantage. And so therefore they can start to stand out um, from, from, from you know, others, others around them. And then in essence, they will start, start to, to, to drive forward. So, I mean, again, an easy one way to look at this is your commercial, commercial forestry. You know, there's a huge demand at the moment in the UK for, for, for land, for, for commercial forestry. Um, and, and, you know, lots of people are going to it as a sort of, as a, as a relatively green investment, if you like. Um, and, and that's, you know, that, that's a good thing. It's, 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 drive, it's driving forward. But can the funds, for example, that are uh, delivering the, these, these investments, can they... Um, articulate the, the wider impact, the wider benefits that they're having on that on that commercial forestry plantation, and look at it very similar to uh, uh, to you know farm farm practices. You've got your you might be monocropping wheat, for example, in, in the middle of your field, or, or or maize. But actually, there's a huge amount going on around the field. There's probably more you can be doing in the field as well. But it's it's all those same principles that transcend across, and this is why then that natural capital lens helps to helps to focus because you then start to articulate the other benefits that are being being provided and i think from from a yeah from a corporate perspective from a business perspective they 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 want to be able to to see where they, those those benefits are especially if they're going to to part with with money they need to be um you know it's financial businesses do very little that isn't financial and so so it has it has to be financial to get them to get over the game line so again for for, for far, from a farming perspective if we just say, well, I'm taking a regenerative agricultural process uh, approach, that's probably not enough. Whereas if I can go into the detail of, of uh, with my soil organic matter and my soil carbon, and I can start to demonstrate that, that to them prior to a prospective soil carbon code, then actually I'm starting to, to go further down the line to justifying to a business why they should be paying for, uh, for carbon sequestered in, in that form. Um, because I can't necessarily, with the price of carbon at the moment, justify planting woodland on, on arable ground. Um, maybe in, in the future, sure, but it's, it's harder to do with, with the carbon prices it is at, at the moment. And so these are all the, the, process, these are all the, the issues that, that um, farmers and landowners and, and, and managers are dealing with at the moment and, and, and weighing up. When's the right time to move on these? And my, my sort of argument with all of this would be to, my, sort of my, my words, my focus would be to get your ducks in a row, get, Get as, be, get as planned and be proactive as possible. And what's so difficult for everybody is that with things like COVID, actually, for the most part, a lot of people want to just batten down the hatches, ride this out. And actually, it's probably the, the worst thing that we can do. We've just got to get in work even harder and start to make as informed decision as possible because that change is, 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 is happening. Um, and we really need to be able to react to it as quick as possible. Alex, that's so good. Um um, I've got a few, there's a few questions that have come in that we'll, tr we'll cut, touch on later because I'm really tempted, to, um, I am tempted to ask them now, but we will do it later. The first question I want to ask, and it's a perfect segue, is uh, two questions that I want to kind of cover. One of which is, um, so on our family farm, so we've got 90 acres just south of Guildford in Surrey. Uh, the first question is, A, what should we be doing practically right now? And the second question, which we can cover afterwards is, you know, what can the UK do or what can we do right now to turn the UK into a case study for the rest of the world? So firstly, starting with our family farm, like what practically could we do this afternoon or tomorrow to actually start moving on this, do you think? So, so, so straight up, I mean, part of this is you can inform yourself that that sort of whole farm report, you're just trying to, to, to see the opportunities in front of you. So, so, so understand what you've got at the moment uh, from a natural capital perspective and how it's performing. But, but then translating that uh, and adding value to that. So one, how can I improve it? Um, and this is exactly what, so what we do with, with, with the grade is the, the value add is how you can improve that asset's performance. So I think also you've got to, you know, for us, it's about illustrating financially what some of these benefits look like. So absolutely. So, 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 so look at bi the biodiversity net gain opportunity or the woodland planting opportunity. 
and illustrate out what that that could look like financially for you now. So I know you've got um, down by the the, the river, um, you've got um, the, the sort of the improved pasture and the modified pasture and and, and the, you know you, you're grazing down on the bottom there. Well, you'll look. I was, would look at that with a triple S I either side. Go. That's a great opportunity, just from a sort of visual perspective. Now, it's a great opportunity to look at that, um, apply the deferometric to it, and go. You know, can I uplift this from from in, in, uh, from you know improved grassland to something like a a lowland meadow or or even a wetland mosaic or something like that, which is going to have a series of benefits. Um, you're going to provide ha um, habitat for, for for wildlife. You're gonna you're gonna have a, an impact on on downstream flow, so some form of flood alleviation. And I don't actually know what, what's downstream with you, but with the with potentially from where you sat, that could be significant for for sediments downstream of you. Um, you're gonna have an impact on on water filtration um, and, and a series of other of other benefits. And the key is that uh, biodiversity net gain is the ability for you to get paid for that. That's providing you with the financial benefit. For not trying to, um, dare I say, scratch a living out of it from a food production perspective, but but allow you to 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 go. Actually, is food production the primary use of this, or is it maybe a secondary one? And if you if if let's say you moved it to uh, Lola Meadow, you would still have to graze that. You know, you then actually would have an obligation to graze it. You'd have to graze it in a certain way that's that's more more beneficial that maintains a higher priority habitat. And so that's how that's I think you know is 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 one way of looking at it and looking at those opportunities. Um, it's then having that imbalance with everything else that, that you've got going on. So I would really encourage people to look at um, the likes of biodiversity net gain, carbon offsetting, sustainability partnerships, water catchment partnerships. Look at that as if you like as a fourth tier of diversification. You know, at every stage, um, you know, this is, every stage we're you know we're trying to um, improve our marginal gains on our, our agricultural production. And for me, I mean that. From a sort of military military background, uh, sporting background, the you know, marginal gains is, is is really important. That's how we keep progressing and, and start to keep continuing to, to do something better. We're then stacking on to, on top of that our agri environment schemes, and I'm sure we'll all do the same with, with elms for those and for those of us not that that's a, that's probably your your first first uh, port of call. After that, there's the series of, of standardised um, diversifications. They're sort of well proven. It's your events. Uh, ecotourism, um, renewables, a series of other sort of standard, as I call them, standardized diversification. Um, that you then try and stack on top of that again the carbon offsetting and those other that fourth tier. And it's really finding the balance. And quite often you'll find that things like the biodiversity net gain may well be complementary to some of the other aspects that you've got going on. But it's trying to balance that out and seeing when when is best to to to, to move and how to integrate that into your in, into into your into into your farming practice. Perfect, Alex. And I, I mean, sounds from what you're saying is it's just building up a very comprehensive view of the holding and looking at the opportunities, i.e. building out a solid business plan, really, isn't it? And knowing what your opportunities are, what might be coming and going and what the financial returns might be off any of them. So, so that is fascinating. And, and I should also say our farm is part of a facilitation fund as well. So yeah. I guess naturally there would be opportunity to work with the other farms in the facilitation funds and focus on, I don't know, riparian buffer strips or maybe you know some form of diversification activity that benefits the whole of the group as well so we kind of become a hotspot for nature and that and i this is, i mean again we, we don't have all the all the answers to elms and the, you know things that are being drip fed, drip, drip fed to us but certainly the sort of tier two that local nature recovery aspect to, to elms um as we start to find out more it will become more certain but i think this is where actually things like our farm clusters um are kind of you know rather than sort of slightly paying lip service and maybe meeting once a year and having a beer um, you know, which some many farm farm clusters are. Some actually do do a lot more. You know, very very proactive. But actually, this is where if we can start to unlock funding in tier two, but we need to be doing it together as as part of a, a farm cluster or a group or a catchment area or whatever it happens to be. Then actually, we're really incentivized to do that because there's a financial benefit and and therefore a, a change that we can we can help unlock. Um, and but it's about being a bit more proactive, more entrepreneurial, and frankly more more active. But I think um, exactly as you said, those, those relations, relationships, that collaborative management, that helps us deliver more impact um, across the landscape. And we can all benefit. You know, if our neighbour is doing something really well, we're going to benefit from that. Um, so I, I think it's a really important aspect. Perfect. And I guess when you combine that combined effort and you have the metrics or the measurement technology or the tooling, whatever, to measure the outcomes, again, it allows you to trade with the natural capital market in a much more powerful way because you've got a really 
proper tradable asset or you know, a series of outcomes that you're trading. So Alex, that's absolutely brilliant. So conscious of time again, um, the next question is, yeah, how can we turn the UK into a case study for the rest of the world? Like what do we need to do as a, as a, as a community now to start really putting these systems and processes in place, get the money flow actually working and having a replicable model for the rest of the world? Yeah, in many ways, I think the, the really the straightforward bit of this is it's, it's the tool sets. Um, so so it's, 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 it's having an accredited sole carbon code, for example. I mean, we're getting there with things like the Defrometric, um, and because once we're doing that and we're applying that and there's, there's, a, there's that sort of flow of money going through these tools uh, from you know, corporates or from government or wherever it happens to be and, and into or from individuals, peer to, bit, peer to peer is a really significant part of this. It doesn't have, you don't have to be a, a big corporate to offset your carbon, your carbon footprint, but you do need an easy to use reliable uh, tool. And, you know, again, proximity is key. So I would say, just start local we don't have to go straight to, to international stuff start local prove it and then that is where i think things like you know wouldn't it be incredible if something like cop 26 we come out of that um with with commitments to to have an, an, a, a sort of international standardized accreditation on, on for, for carbon offsetting or at least you know starting to bring countries together uh, for, from from that perspective so i think the key is for us just to just to prove it get on with it and, and do it in 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 the uk Let's just let's just make it happen. Let's drive this forward. The, the Australians are doing it. I know that they're doing it in the US. Um, they're doing it doing it in Europe as well, and I'm sure many other countries around the world. And so let's just let's just crack on and do it, and then and then you know make things happen on the ground, and then start to to knit it together. And that's probably the biggest um, sort of piece of work for our for our politicians is to come together um, and and try and, and try and take the best from 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 countries and, and integrate it. Perfect. And uh, Alex, yeah, I, I think this is so encouraging you saying it this way around because it feels like we are masters of our own destiny this way around, right? We're not waiting for someone out there to do something. We're actually able to kind of touch on a few questions people have asked is that we, we can actually ask a little group, whether at a local level, start to build these plans and, you know, ideas to ourselves, start looking to work out how we get trading with that. So I think this will be a really interesting conversation to continue and we'll definitely find ways of doing this as we go forward. And Hopefully, land management 2.0 can be a vehicle for keep bringing people together, getting systems and processes put in place. So, really encouraging. Um, now, conscious time. So, we have Q and A is the next section. So, we've had some great questions, and if anyone else has any questions, do shout. Um, I'll see how much we can cover in ten minutes, and see how quickly I can turn <laughs> questions into something to Alex. So, um, so we've we've touched on um, a farming clusters. How do farming clusters fit into this? From what it sounds like, you say, Alex, it's it's about groups coming together, peer to peer sharing, learning measuring outcomes where possible, potentially creating partnerships and actually having those that information able to be shared with other third parties that might be able to fund. Is there anything else you can say on how farming clusters should really play in this space? I think, I mean, also almost look to successful ones. I mean, the Marlborough Downs one, you know, yeah. look, look, I mean, there's, there's, there's plenty of examples out there already of people that are doing this, you know, brilliantly, you know, so and, and are leading this and with, frankly, very little support at the moment or very little financial um, ben benefit so far. And as that increases, there's more incentive for everyone to do it. I mean, I, I would look at places like, um, I mean, as individuals as well, I think things like Elmley Nature Reserve over on the Isle of Sheppey, um, you know, which has got a fledgling uh, farm cluster coming, coming together there. Um, but I mean, it's just this absolutely incredible place and they've transitioned and made, made, made a huge decision 30 years ago to go from uh, an agricultural, uh, an arable, basically an arable farm, to to in essence a, a, a wetland. But the, from a biodiversity presence perspective, you know what what they've done is absolutely incredible, and they are stuffed full of of lapwing and um, and uh, golden plover and curlew. And I mean, they had they had something like half of the of the southeast um, population of of uh, marsh harriers. Um, overwintering on them. I mean, it's ludicrous. Like figures like that are just extraordinary, and you sort of wonder what else is happening happening around there. But it, it tells you that that, um, a huge, that there's a huge amount going on at Elmley. And whilst they may have potentially missed missed an opportunity, or they've gone too early for uh, from a soil carbon perspective to be able because they've already ha had this had this benefit. Um, actually, they're they're the ones that are that are providing some of that biodiversity um, benefit that we all want to to benefit from. As, as we start to change our practices and, and as that, those, those sorts of wildlife reserves can, can move out from there. So I think just look to look to around you to people that are doing it really well. I, I mean, I'd um, say places like, um, you know, Wild Ken Hill, the Ken Hill estate up in, um, up in Norfolk, 
you know, another great example where they're combining different approaches. So they've got a rewilding approach. They've also got a traditional conservation approach. They're also taking a regenerative agricultural approach. And they've been, you know, fortunate enough to have, you know, a large enough estate to be able to, to, to sort of, um, to, to put these practices into play. But they're having really, really significant, making a really, really significant impact as well. So look, look around to, to, to different estates that are having, are having these sorts of, sorts of benefits um, uh, and starting, starting to move. And, you know, and speak to your neighbours. I always think the biggest thing is farmers, we all just get, we, all we, and land managers, all we do is we look at our own land and we go, you know, we're, we're completely focused on that. And actually what we really need to do is, is lift our heads up, see what else is going on around, around us. Otherwise, we just look for our own little lens. So see, see who else is doing this well. Um, go and speak to them. Most farmers are pretty good at speaking to each other. Um, and, you know, you, and you see, see, what, see what someone's doing. And, um, you know, take their, take their advice and see where it works for you in your own setting with, with your, your own practices and, and drive that forward. Perfect, Alex, because we, we have been hosting um, Land Management 2.0 community meetings and it's been great, you know, landowners sharing with one another what's working, what's not, not working, who do they know that's doing something great and we, we're finding having these kind of community conversations is a really powerful way, of, that knowledge exchange is like unbelievably valuable and people always come away with so much more, um, so that's really useful. Um, the, uh, trying to combine a few of the questions just conscious of time, uh, Ian asks a really good question, I'm going to try and paraphrase it, is that you know, I think it's, it's quite a knotty problem to work at how do you create, when you stack functions, the carbon becomes more valuable, right? Like a unit of carbon becomes more valuable because there's more outcomes. Uh, it's kind of like, how do you value extra benefits that are derived from that carbon? Is there, I mean, I know that's a really complicated problem because to measure that is very difficult, but have you got any ideas on that, Alex? How do you appraise the multitude of benefits that might come yeah how, yeah how would you do that i mean I, that's exactly what we've tried to do with through, through our natural capital grade so so firstly you have to you have to um to to recognize the extent of, of what you're of what of what you've got so so that's why looking at each of the ecosystem services breaking those down and going uh, and going what 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 am i what am i delivering on this this land holding what are those wider benefits i'm delivering then look at um, as we look at it. Uh, look at the connectivity. So, what's the connectivity of my landscape within itself, but also with it, my land holding within itself, but also within the wider landscape, because that's critical to the ability to deliver that impact. And then the third aspect, as I said, is the act is the active management. So it's that outcomes basis, and that's almost the, the proof, if you like, of, uh, of of what you're doing. It's that systematic measuring and reporting, so that you can demonstrate tangible progress. And so I think that's the, the really key aspect. You've just got to, as a, as a starting point, you've got to identify and recognize it um, so that somebody can make an informed decision. And the market, I think the market will come. So I, I'm, not, I'm not a big fan of saying, oh, you'll definitely get you know, 20% on top for, 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 you know, as a premium for doing this. But, you know, the market will start to, will start to recognize where you, know, you, you, where you have a, a land holding that's providing additional benefit for, for from its you know and, and they will pay a premium for those carbon units and that's you know it's just starting just starting to happen um, so I think that's that's where where we you know wh where you, where we start to see it um, in my mind perfect Alex um, great thank you and um, other things yeah in terms of maybe some of the processes that can be used inside that delivery mechanism for the outcomes um, you know we've got obviously region ag, rewilding, all these different things. I know you say that it's a bit of a palette and you can pick and choose dependent on your context. Um, maybe what are the support structures to help, help people, you know, on their own farm, choose what best enterprise to establish um, to derive, I guess, natural capital benefits, but also potentially increase their own revenue from the products that are sold, you know. So do you have any advice on, yeah, how to incorporate new processes? Yeah, absolutely. So, firstly, you have to you look at what, what look at what your ground, what's it capable of doing. So, from my perspective, farming at the top of the Cotswolds, you know, the, you know, we're we're and we've proven it for quite a long time. We're sort of three ton an acre, uh, you know, wheat wheat producing ground. You know, that doesn't compete against four plus ton an acre grounds um, over over in East, East East Anglia, for example. So, um, so, so you have to look at firstly what your ground is is capable of doing. And then look at yourself. You know what? What do you want to be doing? Um, you know, I, I'm maybe dare I say a part, part time farmer because I've you know spend you know my, my nine to five if you like do, doing this sort of nature capital work. And so for me, it's all about my evenings and and, and weekends and, and working with dad. So it's working uh, 
uh, as part of the, as part of a team, so that we're each pulling in the same direction. So part of it for us is we can't be intensive with with our our sort of our labour profile, and that's a choice from for, from our perspective. Somebody else may come to our ground and want to to try and do it intensively, but from my perspective, that's that's not the the, the right approach to grow to go with one how we want to do it, and two. And the type of ground we've got. So I think it, th those are two really fundamental aspects. So what what is your ground capable of, of doing? And and two, um, you know, what do you want to do? And I look at you know I've got a close friend who's a, who's farming around us. You know, on on really large scale, a guy called um, Ed Horton, uh, big on Instagram. Get on and, and look at him. He's taking a regenerative agricultural approach, but he's doing it at a really commercial scale, and he's doing it it really incredibly well. And and he's. Um, articulating what he's doing very well. So even if you just go on Instagram and followed him, you learn a lot, of, you can learn a lot about and understand a lot about because he breaks down what is basically quite a complex process into sort of bite-sized chunks. So you, there's many, many different ways of, of, of approaching this, but first and foremost, it's about um, your land and about you and, and what, what, what you want to, to, to get from that. Perfect, Alex, that's great. And I think the case studies are really just imperative for the next phase because everyone's learning a whole new language essentially here. So I think the more case studies we can produce and potentially do that in Land Management 2.0 and get that knowledge sharing happening, I think that's really going to support us all. I'm going to again try and combine a few questions that have come in. Um, and it's one is about the legal structure that maybe facilitation funds should form to make sure trading can happen in a legal body and also how to avoid double counting or double payments so that you don't get that mismatch. Um, have you got any thoughts on that, Alex? Yes, yeah, so I think you know, one of the big things we're going to start to see a rise of is conservation covenants. Um, and that, you know, covenant is a very standard um, legal term for, for, from, from, for, for landholders. You have positive and, and restrictive covenants. But, but basically, if you think of a conservation covenant, if you, would, if you were to do a 30-year biodiversity net gain deal, um, there needs to be some form of, of process. That legally, you know, holds parties, holds you know the landholder particularly to to account. You know, are, do they deliver on on that? So if you say, yeah, right, I'm going to plant all these trees and I'm going to deliver that, um, you know, this much uh, biodiversity or uh, biodiversity uplift. Well, and and then you don't do it, and you don't do it at a five year or a ten year or fifteen year checkpoint. You're not getting there. You're not on track. There needs to be something that hold, holds you to holds you to account because inevitably there will be lots of people who do it very well and 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 fulfil their end of, end of the bargain but there's always somebody who, do, who doesn't do, who doesn't do it and that's why we have a legal system to, to, to make sure that they do so I think conservation covenants are going to become almost second nature for, for, for everyone and, and that, that's probably one of the key ways to do it but I would also look at it from a, a standard commercial perspective and that you know we have commercial property deals you know 20 years is very standard for anyone in commercial property for for um, you know for large warehouse house lets and things like that. Things like this will, will start to happen with, with, with rights um, over land. And I think you know, one of the big ones is, is around additionality as well for carbon. And this is why people often want to buy woodland carbon units as opposed to, for example, a, a soil carbon unit is that one, we've got an accredited system, but two, you know in the UK that when you plant a woodland, that woodland basically is, 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 gonna, is gonna stay there. Um, because you know we're not legally allowed to go in and, and, and clear fell, clear fell it. I mean, around the world, that's a slightly different ball game, and so that's where um, disparities, disparities can come into play. But things like a, a soil carbon code, I could potentially take my my uh, my soil carbon from a sort of base level of a couple of percent up to you know, six, seven, eight, eight, nine percent potentially, depending on on the areas of, of, of deep clay and, and whatever we might have. But but that that's really important. If I get up to uh, a, higher, a higher level of, of soil organic carbon and then and I've done that and I've been paid to sequester that, that carbon and store it if I then uh, go go in after the end of the deal and plow it all up and start to release it again I shouldn't I, I mustn't be allowed to get get paid to, to sequester it all over again um, later uh, you know I've, I've used up if you like that 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 benefit so I, I shouldn't be able to get get paid again for that carbon being sequestered and stored until I've reached um, where I've set that, that end baseline uh, and, and can start to move on from there again. And I think that's really important. And that's one of the things that a soil carbon code, prospective soil carbon code has got to address so that we don't get double counting, we don't, we don't get um, other, other sort of negative benefit, uh, negative impacts coming through. Alex, that, yeah, thank you. It's, um, yeah, because I think this may be where a lot of facilitation funds are trying to get to now. They want to know how they can start to trade this incredible 
network they've built and obviously it's going to be the funding that's going to be necessary to deliver the outcomes because you know it's uh yeah, while we're working out what Elms is going to look like, we need cash flow happening soon. Otherwise, change isn't going to happen. So um, I think probably, well, given it's 28 minutes past now, I think we're probably going to have to start wrapping up. I know there's so much more we can discuss and we'll obviously find ways of doing that forward into the future. Um, it's probably worth mentioning in the last couple of minutes, just before we do finally wrap up, that next week we do have Charles Cowart actually presenting. Um, so 8.30 uh, next Thursday morning. Um, so if anyone wants to come and join that, we'll, that'll be another part of the conversation, another way of how we start bringing it all together. So um, we will be sending out links and information for people to join that if they want to find out more. Um, Alex, where can people find out more about you and what you're working on? Yeah, so um, visit, visit our website, uh, naturecapital.co.uk. Send, send me an, an email, ar at naturecapital.co.uk. Um, if you've got any questions, more than happy to answer them. I mean, I can see there's probably quite a lot in the Q&A there. Um, if, if your email's with it, I'm more than happy to reply or we can put something out on the, on the, on the group afterwards, Tim. And thank you very much for anyone that's, that's been on there listening. Hopefully it's not just my family on the other end. <laughs> no, Alex, brilliant. Thank you. you know, we had a lot of people here today. So yeah, thank you so much for your time. It's always great to chat and um, yeah, we'll find ways of connecting you with the, you know, everyone that attended today and um, taking the conversation to the next step. So thank you for your time. Thank you everyone that joined today. If you've got any questions, do get in touch with us. We're more than happy to help. And um, yeah, look forward to you attending in future events. So thank you very much, everyone. Have a great day and speak soon. See you guys. Bye.